This morning I want you to just imagine for a minute to think back on what it was like when you first believed. How precious that was. How there was a peace and a relief that come over your heart like you had never known. Am I right? Am I right? Do you remember that day? Amen. That moment when you first believed? That moment of salvation? A the theologian would call it justification. And I promise you for most of you, if not right just immediately after, or just a little bit longer than that, the devil stepped in and he began to attack you, didn't he? He, he uh, caused you to question your salvation or, or even to worry that you could lose that precious gift that was given to you by Jesus. Well, I'm here to tell you today that you cannot lose that eternal life. Amen. You cannot lose it. Once you've received it, you have it forevermore. Um, it would never have been eternal life if it wasn't eternal, would it? It just seems to make sense to me. In this passage, it tells us about our eternal salvation, how God's got us locked down forevermore. If you'll stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God when you find that verse. That we should be to the praise of who? His glory, who first trusted in Christ. Word of God's praise. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, right? The gospel of your salvation. You heard the, the word of truth. You came and you received salvation. In whom also after that ye believed what was done, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed in. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You may be seated. The earnest, it says, of your inheritance. What in the world does that mean? That sounds like flowery language. In other words, the down payment which guarantees the full payment for the thing purchased. Jesus purchased you with His own blood. Do you understand that? When you were saved, you were purchased. And now, it's like an engagement ring He's put upon your hand. It's the earnest of your inheritance. He's promising that one day He's going to receive you into His kingdom. No matter how many times you walk through the mud, mess up and tear up and all these different things, God's got your hand. He's going to lead you. He's going to bring you to the place that He said that would occur if you received Him when you first trusted in your salvation in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? What a blessing that is. This is an engagement ring that does not come off. The church is also known as the bride of Christ. And one day the wedding will take place in that glorious time when Jesus returns and we will be with Him forevermore, right? Matter of fact, for the moment you're saved, He's with you forevermore because He's here with you here today. His Holy Spirit, it says, is sealed inside of you. What a blessing. What a blessing. So we don't live our lives fearing we can lose that precious gift or afraid that we made a mistake in receiving that precious gift, but have our love for giving that eternal gift to us, right? Amen. You see the effects? Everything in how you see God? That affects everything? When we fail, we will fail. We don't see God as some angry father seeking to destroy us. He gave us eternal life. Now when we fail, we repent and we come back to Him. And that's the key, folks. That's the key to it all. We repent and we come back to Him. If you've ever been in His presence, you will miss Him and be drawn back to Him if you step back from Him. This is called repentance. We live out our lives in repentance. When we first come to God, we were in repentance. We were turning from the world and turning to Him. And we live our lives in that forevermore once we received Him too. We repent. We're in a relationship. We were made to be in this relationship with God. This is what all humanity was made to be in was a relationship with God. We've been made a new creation when we come to Him. And a saved individual, when you don't have that relationship, when that relationship's messed up, it, you know, you stepped away from God. He didn't step away from you. You stepped away from Him. And you're in torment, and you're torn up, and you don't know what to do about it. A saved individual just can't not function when he doesn't have that relationship with God. Life falls apart. And Psalm 51 shows this truth. This is where I want to spend the most of our time at today. So you turn your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And in this psalm, um, 
It talks about King David. Now, King David, the Bible tells us, was a man after God's own heart. Boy, I'd like that, wouldn't you? I'd like for, for the Bible to have wrote in Scott Ingram is a man after God's own heart. Boy, what, a, what an honor that would be. Right, Brother Howard? I tell you what, all of us would want that honor, wouldn't he? Well, David, King David, it said that he was a man after God's own heart. Yet, yet, David committed adultery. <coughs> He slept with another man's wife. And then to cover it up, you know what he did? You know what he did? He had that man killed. Amen. So he could move in and take her on into his harem, right? This is what he did. And after he did that, he spent an entire year rationalizing, well, I must keep this quiet for the kingdom's sake. Right? I'm not going to talk of this sin or deal with it. And he was miserable. He wasn't in perfect love with God anymore. He was in perfect fear because he lived every day in that judgment night mode, knowing that God's, uh, I've done this horrible thing and I've not repented of it yet. I've not dealt with it yet. I've not got on the altar and fell down and asked God to, to forgive me for it. He lived in torment. You live in torment here today? You live in torment thinking, my goodness, there's a sin I have in my past I've not dealt with yet. But then God loved him. You know how God loved him? He sent a mean old preacher one day <laughs> to come talk to old King David. Now this, this old preacher's name was Nathan, and he was a, a bold individual, all right? A bold individual to go before the king of all Israel and tell him, buddy, thou art the man, you're the sinner, you need to deal with your sin. He was a bold fella, but he did it out of love because God sent him out of love to do it. If, I, if you, you're under conviction here today for the sin that's in your life, know that God loves you. He's brought that conviction into your life and He wants you to come deal with it here this morning. He wants you to deal with it. Shamelessly. Shamelessly. But He told him, Thou art the man. And, and in Psalm 51 here, we hear how He moved back toward God's presence. Remember? David, he moved away. Ooh, I committed adultery. Whew, that threw me out there. Ooh, I, I murdered. Ooh, I hid it. And he just kept moving away from God. Now we're going to see in Psalm 51 telling how God brought him back to him. Right? Listen to what happens here. First of all, we hear a cry out for the cleansing from sin. In, in verse 1, Have mercy upon me. This is David speaking. O oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. Now this is where repentance, return to God, always begins. You have to have this desire in your heart to get rid of that guilt, to get rid of that sin. You see it as it really is. You, you have to get it away from you. Oh, we could only see that sin as so bad before we did it. Right? We look back on it and see how horrible that was, that, we, that sin we committed. In, in the Shakespearean play Macbeth, have anybody ever read that, looked at that, went through that in school? Uh, there is a, a Lady Macbeth in that. And this Lady Macbeth, she is involved in this assassination of the king, King Duncan. And it gets on her soul, okay? It begins to eat her away that she had part in that. So much so that she begins getting up in the middle of the night, walking around, sleepwalking, trying to wash her hands. She's trying to rub it out. She curses the spot that is on her hands. This little tiny spot that she sees there, it's red. It's a little spot of blood. Shakespeare says, he, he, she says, Here's yet a spot desperately rubbing. Here's the small of blood steel. She's seen this blood spot, a little bit of blood from King Duncan right there upon her hand. Was there any blood there? Well, no. No blood at all upon her hand. But it was upon her heart, wasn't it? She's trying to get it out and she couldn't. That conviction tearing her apart. This is where repentance always begins. Realizing the sin. Realizing how bad it was. And then, then you can stay there and you can be miserable. And David was there for a year miserable in that sin. Some of us may have been 20 years long miserable in our sin miserable, hiding it, pushing it down. But if you truly know God, you go deal with it. Amen. And David was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? And he dealt with it. We need to ask God to cleanse us as David did. 
Look here at verse 3. He accepts responsibility for his sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I just want to make it clear, God. I acknowledge this sin. Boy, that's where it starts, folks. A lot of people want to cast, well, it's somebody else's fault. Well, you know, that Bathsheba girl, she was like running around naked outside her house, and I was like drawn in. I, it wasn't my fault, right? Oh, oh, that man she was married to, I tried to get him to go back, and it looked like he was the one who got her pregnant, right? But he wouldn't do it, so I had to kill him. What else was I to do, right? This is how we rationalize, isn't it? Amen. This is how we justify we justify We make that sin okay, don't we? We make it all right uh, in our minds when it ain't all right at all. But if you want to make it right, you better claim it. Amen. But it's also an acknowledgement of who your sin is against. Who is it against? Is it against Bathsheba? Yes. You took this woman in. She was, uh, 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 you know, she, she was out here doing these things, but you took her in, and, and you were the king, and you were like, come with me. And he's like, well, what else is she supposed to do, right? You initiated that, but it wasn't just against her. It wasn't just against Uriah, her husband, because, hey, you killed him. That was definitely, you did something against him, right? It wasn't just against the people of God that he was the king over. He had done a terrible thing to them as well to, to shame the, the, the uh, place where he was given to, to stand. But all this sin is against God. All those people he sinned against, they're all God's people. I tell you what, if you hurt one of my kids, I'm going to get after you, all right? Amen. I just tell it like it is. If you hurt one of my kids, I'm going to hurt you in some way. I'm going to try to work it out like God would have me to, but I'm going to want to deal with that problem, all right? I am. Yet, yet, they were all God's children, weren't they? Bathsheba was God's girl. Uriah was God's boy. And all them people were God's people. We should feel that way, shouldn't we? It was all against God. What is your sin here this morning? What is your sin? Will you take responsibility for that sin? And then it seems to be we recognize how deep that sin is within us. Look here at verse, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Now, David here isn't blaming his mom for his sin. That may be what you're thinking. In sin, my mother conceived me. What does that mean? He's recognizing how bad a sinner he truly is. There was an old movie, I remember it. The name of it kind of speaks out to me. Natural Born Killers. I'm not going to ask you if you watch that because I hear it's a vulgar movie. I haven't watched it. But I've heard the name Natural Born Killers. Well, you know what? Each and every one of us is a natural born sinner. Okay? Amen. We all fall short of the glory of God. It is inside of us. We were naturally born. David said, in sin my mother conceived me. From a young child there was sin within us. And in the right scenario, who knows the level of wickedness we could accept as doing and rationalize it. I would have never imagined in all my days that the man after God's own heart would be an adulterer and a murderer. Would you? Would you? But he rationalized it. He made it okay. He worked out in his own head. David is seeing here what God sees all the time. We're cruel to one another, aren't we? We're cruel. Amen. We're selfish. We lie. We try to make everyone imagine we're better than we really are, don't we? We all do this. And God sees it so clearly. And every once in a while, you'll get a picture... You'll get a picture if you're down in God's Word and you're studying real hard. You'll get a picture of how bad a sinner you truly are. You ever done that, church? You ever got a picture of just how bad a sinner you truly are? My dad used to say, he'd say, the closer you get to God, the closer you get humbled down, the more you recognize how much sin is in your life, the longer you walk with Him. Amen. And that's true, isn't it? 
And we get humbled by that. Humbled by that. David is saying, I'm seeing it very clearly right now. I've been in this sin, but it wasn't just those sins. There's all sorts of sins, Lord, that I need to deal with. And what's he saying here ultimately? God, this is down inside me. I can't fix it. I can't take care of it myself. I need somebody to take care of it for me. I need somebody to take care of my sin. I need somebody to cleanse me from my sin. What is Jesus doing? What does Jesus do? He cleanses us from our sins, don't He? You can't do it. I can't do it. But He can do it. He can clean those things off here today. Look what it says here in verse 7. Purge me with hyssop. This is something they would do in the temple. They'd purge it with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Boy, that's a full cleaning, isn't it? That's a full cleaning. Only God could clean him up. Only God can clean you up. Only God can, can clean us all up. God's conviction against sin had pressed upon him so hard, it says here in these verses, he felt like his bones were broken. He may have had a broken bone. I, I can't say I've ever had the, the, the badness of that. I've never had a broken bone. But can you imagine how, what it feels like to be broken, to be pushed down? That's what it's like when you're in that conviction. God, I can't move forward. I need you to help me. His heart was broken over his sin and he needed it blotted out. Who needs a little blotting out here this morning? Who needs a clear conscience here this morning? I tell you what, if we get serious with God, I tell you what, we'd have the happiest, happiest faces we'd ever seen, wouldn't we? We would. We'd come clean. Clear our conscience. I don't trust people. I don't trust people who come to an altar, say they want forgiveness, and they show no signs of repentance whatsoever. I don't. They aren't bothered by their sin. They don't feel this breaking down over their sin. I really have to wonder if they got a hold of God or they just want a light cleansing. Let me tell you something. God don't do a light cleansing. He, he covers the whole thing, doesn't He? He cleans you from top to bottom, inside and out. He'll take care of you. But He's not going to just do a light cleansing and let you go down the road, okay? He wants all of you. He wants to renew you. And that's what it says here in verse 10. Create in me, I love this verse. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, I love verse 10. I do. I think we should repeat that whenever we find sinful ways in our heart back in prayer to God. Oh God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Let me have the right attitude again. Let me get myself where I need to be again. Let me continue in your ways once again. A change of attitude. In verse 11, you may say, look at that and say, Ooh, that's kind of troubling, Scott. You've been talking all this idea about having eternal salvation. And, and then he says here, David said, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Does that mean that, that he can take his Holy Spirit away from me? Does that mean I could lose my salvation? And the fear runs all over us, right? All over us. There are folks who use this verse to affirm in one sense, he loses the Holy Spirit and he falls away from a salvation. However, this verse teaches nothing of that at all. This is a long time after he sinned with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Yet at this time, the prayer is not restore my Holy Spirit, right? Because he would have lost it when he sinned, according to that idea. As in the next verse, he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. But he doesn't say restore to me my Holy Spirit. He says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This demonstrates that he had not lost the Holy Spirit. This actually refers to the Spirit's work associated with one state as a child of God. That a child of God can commit adultery and murder as David did, and yet not lose his Holy Spirit. Isn't that something? Amen. Isn't that something? Yes. Well, what does he mean by take it away from me? Well, let me tell you something. He is talking about kingship over his people. See, he had gained that spirit-empowered authority to stand in front of the people of God, right? He had a witness before the people. The king before him, King Saul, his Holy Spirit stepped away from him, right? 
He didn't have that, that authority over the people. He lost his witness for God. Let me tell you something, folks. We don't ever want to lose our witness for God. Amen. Paul talked about it in the New Testament. He said, I discipline myself so that after I preach to others... I don't become a castaway myself. And that's what you do when you get out here in this. David lost his witness of God in this, didn't he? People look at him, oh, they're mocking God because David was out here committing adultery. He was out here murdering. There's no witness there. It's true here that David still loves God. He's repenting. He's coming back to him. But he doesn't have the same place in God's place anymore, right? He says, God, let me allow me to continue to be the king. And he does, and man, he, he, there's judgments come upon him for this sin within his own life, right? But he allows him to stay and be the king. In some places, though, you commit a sin, you're out. If a pastor gets into a terrible, terrible sin, he shames the church, right? Be a bad witness. He loses the ability to preach the Word of God in those people's lives. Let me tell you what. If you're down at your work and you're in some terrible sin, you're losing the ability to preach God's Word in those people's lives, okay? Let the Holy Spirit be taken away from me that way, Lord. We know what's really going on here. He says to restore the joy of my salvation because I've lost it. Because I still got my salvation, don't I? I still got it. Look here, verse 12, verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David wants to be sitting next to God again. And there's joy in that place, isn't there? You ever notice how an old cow out in the field? Y'all, y'all, we live out in the country, don't we? You ever notice how an old cow out in the field? He'll have his whole hay field to him, but he'll stick his head right down into the, the, the hard old barbed wire and rip the skin off the back of her neck, that old cow will, and try her best to get that little bit of hay way over there in the corner, right? Oh, if I can just get... Got all the hay she could eat all her entire life, but she'll tear her neck apart just to get a little bit of hay Amen. on the other side of the fence. It's a stupid cow, isn't it? Amen? Amen. It's a stupid cow. Amen. It's a stupid David. He had everything. And he stuck his head across the fence to go to uh, Uriah's wife Bathsheba. Stuck his head out there and, and murdered him trying to clean everything up. Folks, I tell you what. Be thankful for where you're at in God's kingdom. Be thankful that he's here with you today. Be thankful for that. How many here could be of a witness of how bad their sins were, but God forgave them? Amen? Amen? Amen. How bad our sins were. Some of us don't see how bad our sins really were. We come up to the altar and we say, God save me. I know I'm not that bad, but I might as well get in here on this. <laughs> Folks, we're bad. We're bad. And when we see ourselves in sin, we need to restore. Lord, please restore us to the joy of your salvation. And then he says, I'll live it out. Look what it says here. In verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are what, church? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. God, I know what you want now, David says. You want me to take this relationship seriously. I'm going to go teach others. I'm going to go sing. Do you sing in church? I'm, I don't look backwards to see who's singing and who's not. But I have no idea within my mind whatsoever why you come to God's house and wouldn't lift up His name in praise. Okay? I have no idea within my mind. When I was in Bible school, when I was a kid, we would stand there and we was embarrassed because we didn't want to do anything, right? But when I grew up, I was a man and I sung God, God's praises because He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy. Why do you come down to this house? Because He's worthy. Why do you uh, spend your time preparing a, a lesson, preparing a message? Because He's worthy. Why do you prepare the bulletins and get them all together? Because He's worthy. Why do we, we, we gather here together and prepare these big events for people that they come through? Because He's worthy, right? 
Because He's worthy. He's worthy. And why is He worthy? Because He's God. And why is He loved? Because He saved my soul. Right? He's good. He's good. You don't just want me to bring my sacrifices and get a get out of hell free card. You want me to see this world like you do, don't you, God? This world is filled with people hurting one another. Filled with me hurting others sometimes. You want me to choose God, don't you? To live in this world seeking to stay away from those ways and draw closer to you. And that's by seeing Him as being worthy. Worthy. Let me sing your praises. Let me sing your praises, God. Finally this. Look what that will well, look what'll happen here. When we get serious about our relationship with God, when we'll sing His praises, when we'll, we'll worship Him out here in this world, what it says here in verse 18, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon their offer. Did you hear what that said? Then they will offer bullocks upon thine altar. The world will see the reason in giving that contrite heart, that sacrifice of spirit. Seeing our example will lead other people to God. That's always what led other people to God. It wasn't the, the, the most fascinating way to share the gospel. It wasn't the newest thing out here of how to do this. You know what leads people to God? It's your example. It's your example. And if people aren't being led to God, what's wrong? We need to work on our example, don't we? Amen. Right? Our example. If you look like you're miserable when you come to church, I wouldn't want to go be with you either. If you're always complaining about what's going on down there, I wouldn't want to be there either. If you're always saying, man, can we get this over with? Nobody else wants to stay either. Right? Break my heart, God. Nathan looked up and he said, thou art the man, didn't he? And you know what? David was a smart man. He listened. He listened. Do you think God called you to change the world? Sometimes we get that mindset when we first get saved. God didn't call you to change the world. God called you to change you. <laughs> you all right? And when He changes you, He'll change the world. He's saving the world one life at a time. Do you know that? One life at a time. Is today your day to draw back to Him? If you knew Him, you never lost Him. Maybe you've stepped away, though. Maybe you stepped away. Can I tell you what? He's not an angry father ready to beat you on the head. He's a father who loves you. His arms are open wide. Amen. He'll run to you if you make the steps toward Him. That's what it says in the story of the prodigal son. He went running to them, didn't he? As soon as he saw Him coming over the horizon. That's our God. Today is the day of salvation or restoration or worship. Which will it be for you here today? Which will it be?